is uh, welcome to any of the new folks. Uh, we meet every two weeks. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nathaniel, who will be discussing Alpine Linux today, which is very exciting. So Nathaniel, feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. So I am Nathaniel Coppa, and I'm the founder of Alpine Linux. And uh, you may have heard about Alpine and maybe seen this uh, slogan, small, simple, and secure. So I am going to talk a little bit about the secure part about it. That was the idea uh, to tell a little bit about the thinking and behind the reasoning behind uh, the security parts of Alpine Linux. So maybe I can start a little bit with uh, where it comes from. So some of the original design goals was a distribution that could run without a hard disk, diskless. And that is a pretty old thing. It's like, uh, I think it's more than 10 years since um, I started with Alpine Linux. So the idea was that you boot from a CD-ROM or a USB stick, and it will, at boot time, extract all the system into tempfs, into memory only, and run from there which means that you could technically remove the boot media. You could remove the CD-ROM, remove all the disks, and it, the system would just run fine. That was the idea behind it. You could also run, have the boot media on a CD-ROM, which is a read-only media, which means you could, you could actually not uh, make any persistent uh, changes to the operating system, so, or you could write protect the U boot USB. So, th so that was the original ideas with uh, Alpine Linux. And the use case for this was routers, firewalls, VPN, proxy servers, VoIP systems. So that was the original target for Alpine Linux distribution. But uh, along the way, uh, the target has changed a little bit. Now we also... Um, it, it turned out that this, this idea with a disposable system fits very well with Docker and containers. So, so that has, uh, Alpine has become pretty popular in, in Docker space. Also servers, desktop use, I use it for, on my desktop nowadays, but, but that's, that's a history, that's uh, where, where Alpine comes from. So, the three things about Alpine. So, as I said initially, I was thinking to talk about the secure part only, but when I prepared this uh, presentation, I figured out that they are all connected. Everything is about security, basically. Because if you make a small operating system, you will reduce the attack surface. There will be fewer lines of code um, with fewer bugs. So if you compare with Ubuntu Docker image, which is 120 megabyte, Alpine is only four megabyte. That's a significant difference in, in the size. So if you calculate this, uh, let's say there are one bug for every thousand line of code, then you get significantly fewer bugs in, in Alpine Linux. So, the, so, so that Alpine is small is actually one of the important part that makes Alpine more secure. Uh, another goal we have is keep things simple. That means that we don't install a lot of things that you has not explic explicitly asked for. We don't start services automatically that you do on, for example, Ubuntu and Debian. We, we don't start things, we don't install things. Uh, so you don't get any unexpected surprises. So if if you need something, you will have to manually install it and start it. Also, if, that we try to reduce complexity, improve security. Uh, if the code is simpler, if the system is simpler, then that uh, an effect of that, a result of that will be that there are fewer security bugs and the overall security will actually improve. 
And for the secure part, we are doing, we have a hardened kernel uh, for Docker, um, in Docker context, that is maybe not so interesting since uh, in Linux kit, they have their own uh, separate kernel. But we have also a hardened tool chain. I will talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So the hardened kernel, we, one of the things that has always been in the Alpine Linux distro is GR security. You have probably heard about that. It's a patch for the kernel, which improves security. And I just loved the idea uh, behind packs when I read about it. I, I, I met it with the um, Gen 2 hardened. So the, the, actually the first releases of Alpine was built with Gen 2. So, so I used the Gen 2 hardened, the hardened tool chain and the geosecurity uh, kernel. And some of the mo more interesting bits there are the, in, that they enforce non-executable pages, mem those memory protections that prevents you to both have execute permission and write permission. So there are various features in, in the packs there. Also the address space layout randomization. I have a nice uh, spelling error there, I see. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, where you randomize the memory, where, where the memory allocations are, where the code is. So next time you run the same executable, the addresses will be on different uh, places. You're, you're probably familiar with that. And one of the recent things they have added to um, GR security is the reuse attack protector. I think that's uh, an interesting uh, thing too, that they, they prevent you to, to do code reuse in the kernel. And then there are a lot of other things in packs. Uh, the GR secure, this is, those features here are actually packs. There are more interesting bits in, um, in uh, GR security. But that, that's not maybe not so interesting in, in, in this context. Uh, but what is interesting though is that those memory protections, they are more useful if you, they have some help from user space. That means if the executables are compiled as position independent executables, then those um, memory protections will be much more effective. For example, the um, uh, main binary will be randomized and will be protected. Also this uh, here, uh, full relocation read-only, RELRO, RELRO uh, the linker flag, together with uh, bind now, will, will also make uh, more parts of the program protected with those uh, user, with those kernel protections. Some of those hardened kernel protections have made it to, to Linux uh, kernel upstream. So, so it's a, so they will actually be in effect also, especially if you have those, uh, the user space built with Pi and with uh, RELRO. Okay, uh, are there any questions uh, so far about that? I think I just uh, move on then, the hardened um, tool chain. So in Alpine, we have, we have used uh, Gen2 hardened um, patches for the tool chain which means that we enable Pi by default. That includes the, um, when, when you build static binaries. We also enable the um, rel row and bind now by default, which means that your, uh, your binary, will, you will have the ASLR protections uh, for the main binary, not only for the libraries. 
that is the difference. So, so if you check in the elf header, the binary will look like it is a um, library, uh, even if it's an executable. It, it, this also means that the um, got table, the global of the table, will actually be right protected in the binary when, when those are enabled. And uh, the, we have also um, stack smashing protection. We use the stack protected strong by default. And we enable defortify source. That means that if you don't explicitly disable the feature, you will have it there. So we don't set the C flags environment variable. And when we build the packages, we, we patch the tool chain itself. So if you take the Alpine uh, toolchain, the Alpine GCC, you will have those features enabled, unless you, you tell GCC to not, uh, unless you tell GCC to disable it. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I know other distributions, they, they enable those things for many of the binaries, but, but in Alpine we do it for everything, basically. Uh, I can say a little bit about the defortify source. The implementation we use there is uh, an, an add-on to muslibc. It's not included in the libc, but uh, it's an it's, um, add-on, a few headers only. It's pretty simple. Yes, so any questions about that? No, nope. we move on. So another part of Alpine Linux is MusLibc. And the website says that MusLibc is a new standard library. It is lightweight, fast, simple, and free, and strives to be correct in the sense of standards, conformance, and safety. So the interesting thing for when it comes to security is the correctness that MusLibc um, strives for. Uh, the design goals they have the design behind it they want to be very correct um, and pr pr give you some guarantees that you don't have in for example glibc also the code base is uh, clean i don't know if you have seen the glibc code base it's a, it's a bit uh, messy and uh, the muscle libc is just beautiful if you compare they have also get get getting rid of all, all those uh, uh, backwards compatibility things that you have in glibc. So 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 it's much much cleaner. Also, the size of libc is a, a bit uh, significant. It's only 580k. I checked today, and glibc is like 10, 11 megabytes. It's only five percent. So, so you have a lot of uh, there. There is so much uh, less code in in MassLibc. So there are fewer smaller attack surface basically. I checked the the CV list uh, earlier today also how many CVs there are in glibc and since two thousand in glibc I think there were eighty two. Some of them are in the in the programs that comes with glibc, but there are a significant amount of bugs, security bugs in glibc. Some of those things are in the RPC uh, things and the resolver and things that most people never use. Um, so, and, and much of that code doesn't even exist in libc. So. So that's a, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, so what, what does that mean when I say correct in this sense of safety? One thing they have done, I, I will show you, give you some examples of it because it shows, illustrates a bit uh, the way the MassLibc developers are, are thinking. So they have unified libc, libpthread, LDSO and libmath, libm. In glibc, there are several binaries. In libc, it's a single one. That means that you can perform atomic upgrades. If you upgrade the libc on your system, 
is only one file and and the upgrade is, is done in one shot if if you upgrade glibc when you have have it spread over four or five files you cannot really guarantee that the upgrade is atomic what happens if you if you start a program when you where you have replaced one or two of the files the libc but maybe not the libp thread and you start the program in in just that second then interesting things may happen <laughs> and glibc cannot guarantee that that goes well in most libc they can guarantee it they have other guarantees as well which is related uh, to the implementation of tls thread local storage so they they reserve all the storage time uh, early which, which means that you can actually fail to, to do to do the operation you will actually get a return code error code that this didn't work in glibc they cannot really guarantee that so you may experience that things abort that your uh, uh, program just aborts because um, you run out of memory this has a side effect that gl close if you close uh, library you cannot really do that you when you have allocated this memory with dl open it's always open but the, the good thing is they take those corner cases that you may experience in glibc but with libc they guarantee that this will work uh, some other example is the utmp wtmp and libc hasn't even implemented it it's only stubs and the reason why is because you cannot implement it in the same way to be able to use those features you, you need to use a suid or a skid to work properly and and that is generally a bad idea so they say okay we don't even implement that you will get an error message the, the function is there but you will only get the error message so if you really, really need that, you should, uh, you will have to <laughs> be very careful. Uh, there was another example that I uh, discovered a couple of months ago with a function in muslibz, get ment ent r, which is a thread safe uh, function. Uh, the, the history went is that uh, in uh, OpenJDK in Java, they experienced uh, some problems when they were running on Alpine, and uh, on glibc it just worked. So I digged into what the problem really was, and it turns out that in Java they will read the the mount to get the mount flags, and when they do that, they use this thread safe function, which you have to allocate a buffer for. So it stores in, in your own buffer. That's is what makes it thread safe. But in Java, they have only allocated 1024 bytes for it. And that was not enough when you run in a Docker environment with the overlays. And with glibc, what they do there, they just truncate the line and say everything is fine but with libc they will actually give you uh, an, an error return you an error and say you know what you don't have a big enough buffer for this uh, this thing and in the java case it actually worked but you cannot really know when this will blow up in your face with libc it will pop up to the surface because they are very correct in the sense of safety and you can actually you can fix the real problem behind it and that's one one thing i really like with libc okay so you may have noticed i have talked about security in alpine i haven't mentioned anything about the tracking cvs and fixing security bugs and we do actually track cvs we do fix security bugs and we try to do it as soon as possible but one of the 
uh, the thinking behind Alpine is that effective security shouldn't really depend on how fast you fix your security bugs. That, is how, that has been the philosophy from the start of Alpine Linux. So that's also why, we ha why I liked GR security so much, because in instead of just saying a security bug is just a bug, it just needs to be fixed. Instead of having that thinking, we try to figure out how can we prevent, how can we discover early that the bug is there, that the security bug is there, and how can we prevent that the bug is uh, getting exploited? That's basically the, the thinking behind it. So, so even if we do fix CVs, I don't think that is the most important thing. I think uh, that there are other things we can do to improve security. And, and it's, I think it's also, I have to say that, I think it's nice to see that it's starting to catch up in, in mainline kernel and other security in, in general security uh, business uh, that is i think they are improving and that's that's nice encouraging to see okay so what about the future uh, we are here are some random things that i um, thought about when preparing this presentation when it comes to security, uh, we are have a project work building every package in its own container. And the reason we need to do that is basically that we run a test suit for every package. If the package has a test suit, we try to run the tests on the, on the builder. And sometimes the tests that we leave um, remaining uh, remaining processes afterwards, they don't they are not very good to clean up after themselves. So we need to build each package in a separate container. We have a project of rewriting the package manager. And then we will um, implement some of the ideas from Tuff and get rid, of, get rid of those hashing functions that are not safe enough and some other things. We are also working on better support for uh, safe languages like Go and Rust. Um, we have uh, Go already, and it works good. But um, in upstream Go, there are there are some issues. The test uh, test suit fails on some some parts, so there are some work needs to be there are some more work needs to be done there. Rust we have for x86 uh, the 64 bit I think, but it, it needs to be ported to the other. Uh, architectures as well, so there are some work need to be done there. And then there are some more things that we need to do. We have um, a lot of SUID, or we have some SUID executables, and I would like to reduce the number there. Main repository has 32, community has 17. We have marked them so we can, we know exactly which package, uh, which has a SUID binary. And the, the build script, the A build, will uh, give you an error if it finds a SUID executable. And then you will have to check it out, mark it. So, so we, have, we have control over those. But I would really much like to reduce the number of those. What, what's the strategy? Like, are you switching to capability, like file capabilities, or um, what's the, like, a plan? Uh, we do that. that has to be taken with each uh, package. So, so to be honest, I don't really know. I don't have a plan for <laughs> for it. Okay. So, so that has to be worked out. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Alpen seems like a really good opportunity if you wanted to have a system that did not use uh, root access at all and make it strictly capability based, because it's small enough that uh, it seems like a tractable. Uh, effort as opposed to trying to do that for something like Ubuntu or Fedora, where you've got more set UID root things than you can really comprehend. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> uh, my thinking about the capabilities in general of the kernel is, uh, 
Well, actually, that's another discussion. We can we can take that another time. But <laughs> um, there is also need for uh, automatic testing. We do test each uh, if if the package has a, um, a test suit at the build time. We actually run the tests, and that has shown to be very uh, good. For example, we got we discovered a CV or we reported what became a CV in Libre SSL the way they uh, handled the certificates in Nginx. It was actually not working very good, and we discovered that when we enabled automatic testing at build time. Uh, I would like to do some more automatic testing also the kernel and uh, more advanced stuff. Um, but I don't really have any big plan there. I just have <laughs> the general, uh, I just see that there is a general need to, to improve that, the automatic testing. Uh, it would also be nice with more code reviews. There have been some already, some um, security researcher that uh, looked over the APK package manager found CV and, and that got fixed and I'm very happy for that. So I would like to see more of that uh, code reviews of uh, MuscleLibC. And I saw you, Tycho, you, you reported, you asked about this uh, stack gap thing in MuscleLibC. Where you get an answer, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. They I get a, was there an answer? I did never get one. Uh, there was an answer that uh, they gave you. The, the, the answer was uh, this is those are the functions that may be affected. Ah, okay. I didn't see that somehow. Okay. Okay. So, so they want? actually, <laughs> there was a handful of functions that actually allocate more than uh, 4K, uh, more than a page. So, if there are any issues, they are in those functions. Right. So, okay. so that that's code review. I think should be nice to have followed up and and just. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I won't. I never got CC. Maybe they took me off CC and just sent it to the list. Uh, yep. I can. I, I can do that. Um, yeah, that's I'll find it. No, no problem. I'll find yeah. it. So, so I also wonder if 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 it would help if we allocate uh, two pages instead of one. As a as a protecting, because then then there would be none of the functions would be uh, uh, then everything would be within within the limit, and I actually think that one of the Alpine developers applied a patch for Alpine where they increased the this safety uh, page to two pages instead, so it's pos quite possible that. That it's no problem at all. We can we can prove that it's no problem at all at, in Alpine Linux. But I, 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 it would be nice to have that followed up. I think. Another thing that is worked on is um, at least talked about is to switch to to LLVM, CLang, Clang as the default compiler in Alpine. And there are some nice things in in. Uh, LLVM, CFI, I think is especially interesting. But that is a bit, it's a bit in, in the future, I think. We will still need GCC for maybe the kernel for some things, it will be there as an option. But I would like that the default C compiler is, um, is LLVM based. Uh, there are some, there are some of the architectures that are where LLVM does not produce as efficient code. So it might be that we will have to have LLVM for just few of the architectures and use GCC for others. But I'm not really sure what, what to do there. And then there is a, another thing I mentioned here is a default thread stack size, which is, an interesting issue with MuscleLibC. I don't know if you have experienced that. So 
the, the story is that in MassLibc, the default thread stack size is only 80K, 80 kilobytes, which is very little. GLibc uses eight megabyte. This is very good for embedded use. For server use, it's maybe a little bit too small. And there are some Python libraries that will simply not start even because uh, because they allocate a lot of things in in the on the stack. In in theory, you shouldn't really allocate big buffers on the stack, but in practice, many people does that, and I have seen an increase use uh, that people does it more and more. So so I think that's something that could be investigated if it might be worth. Uh, increase the uh, thread stack size in MuscleLibc. But of course that needs to be taken with the uh, MuscleLibc developers. Okay, I think that was about it. Are there any questions or thoughts? Uh, I've got the probably the, the most obvious one. You probably, you're probably tired of answering this one. Uh, but now that GR security has taken uh, taken itself private, what is your strategy or mindset toward the, what you've been getting from GR security in the past? Uh, what what was the question? What is my uh, mindset your or strategy? Okay, so yeah, GR security. Oh, is, yeah, GR security has been taken taken private. What you going to do about it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, currently, what we are doing currently is that we take the latest stable, the latest uh, release we got, uh, which is for the 4.9 kernel, and we uh, maintain an unofficial fork of it. That is a little bit risky because it's uh, it can be complicated, and. Uh, but it has it has worked quite well so far. We used to have the testing patches earlier, uh, which was very helpful. Now that we don't have the testing patches anymore, that work has become increasingly more difficult and more risky. But my thinking so far is, uh, my, my thinking is so long as we can use the GR security, an official GR security patch, we will use it. And when we can no longer use it, we will have to figure out what we do, and then we will just have to drop it. I think. Are you, are you participating at all in the uh, the kernel hardening project Case Cook is is running? No, I'm not. Um, and uh, part of the reason is uh, because I actually want to continue to use the GR security, and uh, there is it's a bit. Uh, there's a little bit Mind of political feed. there. Yes. Okay, that's fair. Uh, so, so I, I have a, I haven't really tried to get involved because I haven't, I, I didn't want to, uh, of respect to spender. That, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Okay. So, so I talked a little bit with spender uh, when they went private in, in when he started to talk about go private, and. What he said, uno unofficially, is that they are thinking of maybe uh, releasing testing patches regularly. They have, they are playing with the thought of it. So, so I have hope that they will actually, when they come a new long-term support kernel, that they will really release another testing patch, and uh, that we can we can use as next base. But at the same time, it is. It's, it's not really a, a good solution because you cannot really rely on something that is so unsure. So I think we will likely have to stop using uh, the GR security patch at some point. Okay, what do you plan to do then? Then we will use the, whatever is in mainline. Okay.
Yep. Yeah. Are there any other uh, questions? Well, I can do another one if nobody else wants to. Um, uh, Casey, I won't go ahead. You go first. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, POSIX capabilities, um, you indirectly expressed uh, what sounded like some reservation with regard to uh, that that particular mechanism. Could you uh, talk about that just a little bit? Um, the thing is that it's uh, it's a blacklist and not a whitelist. Basically, you have to disable remove uh, things. At least uh, the impression I got. Um, not sure I understand that. Yeah. No, so 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 you have to remove capabilities. Uh, you have a process that can 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 do everything, and then you have to remove this capability, and then ah. you remove this and this. Uh, and ah. if there are new, uh, and if there are new things in the kernel, if you de develop a new subsystem or you develop a new capability or something, then you will have it enabled by default. You will have you ah. will have the capability. So ah. so I think that's it, if that's if. You that's if you no, that's if you're root. Uh, so one of the notions that that's been floating around for some time, and in fact there have been systems, uh, Unix systems that that used positive capabilities that ran without root at all. So UID zero is just UID zero. It does not con con convey any privilege. Um, so in that case, you can have a, cap a system that uses capabilities. Uh, in which UID zero is just a UID and the only thing that's used for privilege checks is the capabilities. Uh, so uh, in that case, you're not starting out with all privilege and, and, and dropping it. Uh, you can use file-based capabilities so that when a program runs, it runs with, those cap with the appropriate capabilities. And the, the capability mechanism is, is more complicated than it probably needs to be in support of programs that are written, assuming they're going to be set UID root, um, but that are running on a system where root doesn't actually convey anything. So you can actually you know, provide the capabilities that the program needs, uh, turn off capabilities you don't need um, in a completely general way. So you can do that and you don't need to start off with all capabilities and drop them. So you can do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes, that's something I, uh, uh, that needs to be investigated. And I think that that might be a way to get rid of the sewer route and that would probably be worth it. <laughs> well, and one of the advantages to it is that even if you do have programs that are set UID route, that doesn't give them privilege. It merely changes their user ID. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I will um, I will keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay. Rias, did you have a question? Yeah. So first, uh, thanks for this presentation. It was awesome. Um, my question is, we kind of have talked about it. You and I have talked about it um, offline. But uh, one thing that we didn't mention today so far were uh, Linux security modules. I know you and I have talked a little bit about FRM, RC Linux, other flavors. I guess I'm curious if uh, in the future you see Alpine Linux supporting maybe one of the newer ones or the existing ones, kind of your, just to get your thoughts about LSMs and Alpine. Yeah, so I am a little bit influenced by Spender there, I must <laughs> admit that. And he didn't really like the security models in, uh, in, in how they were implemented in the kernel uh, with SLE Linux uh, when, when that started basically. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I think that's something that uh, could be interesting to uh, figure out. Uh, for example, App Armor. I'm not really a big fan of SLE Linux because it's complicated. App Armor seems a little bit simpler, um, and that's something I I'm open for. Yes. It, it's not. It's not. It's not on the roadmap currently. Uh, it's not a priority thing, but that's something I think it could be implemented and supported. Nice. 
you have any thoughts on the kind of the newer ones in the pipeline, like Landlock? Um, I guess Sarah, if that's if I'm pronounce, if there's another way of pronouncing it, but just curious. I haven't, I, I haven't uh, followed there, so I actually don't know. Okay. I can send them your way. Have, you can send me the link and I will uh, check those up. Okay, other, other questions? Uh, I have one more. On your slide about the thread local storage, you said that Musil pre-allocates it and glibc does it on the fly. Uh, I don't understand what the advantage of pre-allocating versus doing it on the fly is, I guess. Let me see if I can go back to that one. Yeah. So the uh, I, I wait, no, my battery is running out here. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah. So uh, with glibc, it's when you have lazy lazy loading uh, of, of things in glibc it's lazy allocated so when they need it they allocate it and and then uh, then there there is a, at a point where uh, where the deal open or the pthread creates function actually will uh, succeed you get okay everything is fine everything is running and then they will lazy later on allocate uh, the the, the needed memory for the, the TLS. And at that point, it's already too late. You can no longer abort and say, hey, hey you, you cannot give a, a, an error code and say that this operation failed. And, and then, then glibc will abort, we call the abort function, which basically is, it stops the program. So, so then as a side effect, uh, DL close is a, a no-op, but can't you just free that memory if you don't need it anymore? Or uh, it's I haven't I haven't uh, read the the details about it. But that's that's one of the side effects of that. There are other reasons that they deal close is uh, no op. But the point there is that they they give you some guarantees with uh, with a deal open and and, and deal close that you don't have those corner cases where you suddenly run out of memory and something you, you cannot handle the, the error. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Okay. Then I um, say thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. That was really awesome, I think. It was very, very interesting to hear about, especially in Linux Kit, we've borrowed some of the Alpine uh, user space tools in particular. So it was very interesting to hear your perspective. So thank you. Um, I guess I'll share my screen now. I have a couple of just announcements for next time. So let me get this going. So, as I mentioned, next time uh, will be in two weeks, as we meet again, uh, which will be August 16th. Uh, we have scheduled a deep dive uh, from uh, the Linux O-Kernel project. So actually, there's a project today um, in the Linux repo uh, you can play with uh, that, that is, let's see, try O-Kernel, uh, where O-Kernel is a mechanism in which you can split the kernel into inner and outer kernels of different privilege levels. And so I think Nigel's on the call. Um, hope I didn't miss any bits there. Please feel free to chime in. But I think Nigel and other folks at HPE who are running this project uh, will be giving us a really great deep dive. So it should be a good time. Um, if there are any calls for additional topics that you'd like to discuss, uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll be posting an agenda uh, in Markdown on the repo shortly. Um, and if there are any other questions, I think we have a few minutes, um, happy to discuss or address them. 
at MyWorksOn.com. Okay, so I guess if anything comes up, please feel free to reach out to me on my email, uh, raise a Docker, or the Linux Kit community channel Slack is a good place to reach, I think, most folks here. Uh, thank you again, Nathaniel, for the excellent deep dive, and I'll see everyone in two weeks. So, thanks. Thanks. All right.